Welcome to Value Investor TV Podcast. This is the podcast to help you grow your wealth and become financially independent. Yep. My name is Becco and my par- partner, Hari Radhakrishnan, looking very cozy today. Oh, it's nice and warm. <laughs> Cold outside. <laughs> All right. We'll talk about this kind of cash flow formula in this episode, episode 20, 32. Wow. 32. Imagine that. Yeah, we're... Uh, this podcast is about to have a midlife crisis. <laughs> yeah, th- yeah, exactly. Dang, 32 already. <clears throat> wow. All right. And for our midlife crisis, we're going to be talking about individual companies. Yes. So. Yes. Very, very, very appropriate. Yeah. You know? We've we've moved on from <laughs> our graduated from our uh, education onto yeah. actually doing real stuff. Yes. You know? Exactly. Moving out of our mom's basement. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. In this episode, we're going to talk about the actual formula for discounted cash flow. In the, in the previous episode, we talked about kind of the overview of what it is uh, and some pros and cons of discounted cash flow, when you use it, what to use it for. In this, in this episode, we're going to talk about the actual formula. So what is discounted cash flow? So um, as I said in the last episode, discounted cash flow, let's just do a quick refresher of what it is. Yep. Discounted cash flow is, is calculating the earning potential of... The future cash that the company can generate, you can you'll predict that in the future, and you discount that back to the present value. Yep. And we talked about the present value of money, time value of money, in the previous episode. So if that doesn't ring a bell, please go check out our previous episode. So discounted cash flow is again the summation of the free cash discounted back to the current price. Yep. So tell us a little bit about that, Hari, and some of the variables that goes into the formula. So w- what you're going to do is take the free cash flow for the current year, which is measured by cash flow from operations, and uh, you subtract out the maintenance part of the capital expenditure, which is sometimes not obvious from the balance from the uh, cash flow statement. We have to look into the footnotes, you know. Uh, or management's discussion of the statements. Um, and when you subtract those two numbers, what you get is the free cash flow, right? And so that that is the number that you can say means I can take all of this money away from the business, from the day-to-day operations of the business, and the business will still operate successfully, right? So that number, you want to estimate how much that number is going to grow. So let's say that it's year one is $100, and year two, you expect the company to grow at a 10% a year for the next five years. So that number will become uh, 110. 110, then 121, then 132, and look, I can do math, right? Uh, you know, and so on. So what, what that number does is it is effectively just keeps going up and up and up, right? Uh, actually, I don't think it is 132. But anyway, this is something that you can measure going forward. Um and and what you're what you're going to do is take all of those numbers and then every single year that you have that you're going to discount that. So the further out that number is, the smaller the number is in present dollars, right? Do, so why does that make what, you know why do we have to do that, right? So when we what we talked about last episode is a dollar today is not worth is worth more to you than a dollar tomorrow. So there has to be some amount of increase in order for that dollar for you to defer having that dollar in your pocket today, right? Yeah. So every every decision that you make, when you start a business, you are investing dollars today for dollars tomorrow, right? And so what you want is obviously more dollars tomorrow than you get today. But you also have to take into account that there's a time aspect to this, right? Yeah. That in a year, two, three, four, five is when you can actually start seeing a return on your investment. Um, you know, that money could have just been taken, what you spent over the five years, you could have just taken that and put it into some other investment, right? And what that number is, is called the discount rate, right? And that discount rate is critically important to this concept. Because you can't, if the discount rate is, you know, 0%, then you're essentially saying that I'm indifferent if the money, you gave it to me tomorrow or you gave it to me today. But if you're going to give it to me tomorrow, then I want you to give me a dollar ten instead of a dollar or a dollar twenty, right? So the way you measure that discount rate is there's 
you know, the safest measure is the, you know, long-term treasury bill, like a 10 year treasury bill will give you, uh, at today's market prices, I, I don't know exactly. It's probably less than 5%, maybe three to three to 4%, somewhere around that. Yeah. Right. So if you put your money into a treasury bill, that's the safest rate of return that you could get three or 4%. Um, <clears throat> you could also consider that the S and P 500, which is, uh, an index fund, so you could say I could put my money there. Historically, the S&P 500 has gotten between a 7 and 9% rate of return, depending on whether you count dividends in there. Right, but So that's those are two oppor- what we call, uh, ec- economists call opportunity costs, right? Which is if I, if I don't put my money in company A, I'm putting it in, in the treasury bill. Or if I don't put it in company A, I'm putting it into the S&P 500. So that's that's the general thinking behind it. Now, the way Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger describe it in their annual meetings and shareholder letters and so on is it's the opportunity cost for their best investment. Mm. If I were to put my money into this company, I can't that's money I can't put into my best investment. So what is the rate of return that I expect for my best investment? Right? And that that best investment is usually you know, you're what you you know what you find as your best investment. You take the return on equity of that, yep. and and you take that number. So, let's say I found a business that has a return on equity of fifteen percent. Well, then your discount rate is actually you know fifteen percent. Well, so now it's you know we went up from three percent all the way to fifteen percent, right? And so, the idea here is that you're trying to create, you know, you know different levels of valuation. And so I would say. Somewhere between the S and P five hundred and your best investment is probably the right choice, yep. right? Yep. So using the the treasury bill at six percent or or three percent is probably way too low, yep. right? The number you're going to see with this cash flow estimate is going to be huge if mm-hmm. you do that. Yeah. Whereas if you use a, some other number, then you're going to have to, um, you know, you're discounting the future dollars fairly heavily. Yeah. Um, and so that's why you want to do this. So you may not have a best investment right now. So maybe just using 10% as the S&P 500, which is typically what I do because it makes the math easier. Right. Yeah. So again, kind of discounted cash flow. Maybe I think it'd be beneficial for us to take le- readers through the actual formula, mathematical formula sure. itself. So if you guys remember back, you know, maybe this was taught in high school. I don't know. The summation. Yeah. The summation. Sig- sigma notation. Yeah. Summation of, of it's a quotient. So Cash flow for the fir- for year n nth year divided by one plus the discount rate, which is in decimal points. So point, you know, t- if it's ten percent, it's point at point one. Uh, that that the denominator there to the nth power. Um, so I know this might sound like a gibberish, but this is important. And please go ahead and take a look at the actual formula. You know, visibly t- to see it in, yep. in, in writing, so that you can you can follow us and see what the hell we're talking about here. And also, you know, the nth power is the nth year. And usually, uh, you know, you, you, you stretch this out to 10 years uh, because after that point, you know, there's really no point of estimating further because discount rate will diminish the actual dollar value of that 11th year, 12th year, the 15th year uh, to, to almost not, not significant uh, value. Yeah, and, and you probably can't even estimate what something is going to be in 10 years yeah. right? it's very very hard to do that exactly so, so that's the the formula and, and like harry talked about the the discount rate um another way to look at that is i think it actually it's a better way to look at discount rate is the opportunity cost like harry talked about you know yeah. is it is it sfp 500 index or is it you know is it your best investment opportunity the next best the best investment opportunity that you have in your portfolio plugging that in is probably a really good exercise and really good thought process for you to, for you to be for you to be engaging in. Yeah, and one thing I'll say also, you if you go and find a spreadsheet or if you Google discounted free cash flow, they're probably you're probably going to look at a when you look at discount rate, they'll probably talk about this thing called weighted average cost of capital or WAC W A C C. So W A C C is WAC uh, weighted average cost of capital is a. Um, is a term that is used for discounting uh, b- that is essentially m- trying to measure what is the cost that it would be for a business to get 
uh, capital, right? So is that that's borrowing money or ret- you know returns on equity and things like that? And the idea here is that the cost of capital, if it's expensive, there's you know you know you can you can kind of adjust the business's discount model based on how risky the business is. So that if you use a higher, you can use a higher discount rate for a um, a, a business that is a riskier business versus not, right? And so what I would say to that is, one, if you have trouble estimating the future cash flows of the business, then you should just stop. Don't try and estimate the value of the business. Just move on, right? You, there is no value for that company that you can reliably fall on because you can't measure their cash flows in the future. So don't try and... E- Play with the discount rate to see what your, you know, what kind of rate of return you can do, you know, you know, or, or how cheap it can get to, you know, to make that, you know, measurement, right? That's not a good way of thinking about this because um, invariably, you know, what we're talking about right now is kind of what academic finance people do, and those guys don't make any money, right? So let's focus on what the guys who actually make money do. Uh, and that and that's why we're what, what, what we're teaching you. So weighted yeah. average cost of capital is very theoretical, uh, and in theory it sounds really good, but that's not how the world works in practice. Yeah. So we should just simplify our life and just use a um, an estimate of what we think somebody else's you know what is our next best investment, right? Or what is our next safest investment, which would be the S and P five hundred. Yeah. So if I'm not willing to beat the S and P five hundred, then I shouldn't invest. Is that that's the thought process that we should be going for? Yeah, yeah. Another thing, just a commentary on that. I think you know when you look at all these hedge funds and they're making you know, below S and P five hundred index, if yeah. you average it out, I mean that kind of blows my mind away. That uh, that. And that's before their fees too. Before their fees, yeah. You know that that's really kind of blowing my mind away. Like it, it's simple math. Like take a look at S and P five hundred historical performance. That's eight to ten percent, and look at historical performance. All these hedge funds, you know, that's like freaking five, like meager five percent or you know, even two percent. in Some instances, right. you. I mean, just a pro tip for all of you out there: you don't get any uh, extra for just being in a hedge fund, right? You don't get warm fuzzies or anything like that. It doesn't. It's cash is cash, man. And if you if it's not getting you the best rate of return, then you don't do it, right? Yeah. And so, really, what your discussion should be, even you know, thirty one episodes or thirty two episodes into this, is you know, if I want to do this for myself, can I beat the the S and P five hundred? If I can't, then let me put my money in the S and P five hundred, yeah. right? And you're going to do very well if you do that, oh, right? Yeah, sure. Now you can do a little bit better, and that means that you know is 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 a good thing to think about, yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, if you don't have time or interest to investigate, you know, just put it into S&P 500 index. Yeah, they have very low fees. You can get Vanda- Vanguard yeah. has uh, index funds and all of these things can help you, you know, uh, accumulate your wealth very effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and you can buy every month or, you know, just take a sep- some part out of your paycheck, you know, to do so. Yeah. Um, or you can do what we do and make a lot more than the S&P 500. <laughs> Do it yourself. Exactly. So um, this kind of cash flow, again, you know, this is a very important important uh, measurement, important valuation measurements, uh, measurement um, method that people use. And again, to Hari's point, the WAC, you know, weighted average cost of capital. I think it's, it, it'd be worth taking a look at it just to see what it is and realize that this is an academic exercise and this is, doesn't really have really no bearing on, in the real world application and so i think it's simple to i think it's simple and better to default onto you know s&p 500 500 index the op, the opportunity cost of 10 percent or eight percent or nine percent or if you're if you're like hari you know if you don't if you if you could do that or you could do you know your your next your next best or your best investment opportunity take that and look at their return on equity and plug that in here as a as a discount rate yeah, and you'll be surprised to find that some companies have returns on equity of twenty five or thirty percent, in which case, back the truck up. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's where you should be probably putting all your money. <laughs> yeah, right? assuming they're you? cheap. Right, assuming they're cheap enough. Right, right, right. At that point, why would you put it elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the the same thought process is that, and we haven't really done portfolio management or discussed that, but a lot of people have this idea that you have to diversify your portfolio, right, and. As we've talked about with 
uh, with the checklist, you know, management doesn't diversify their portfolio. Some of the managers of great companies have 100% of their net worth in one yeah. company, which is the company they run. Yeah. And if you're investing alongside them, what is the risk? You know, you're risking your capital just like they are, right? And so their future performance and success is dependent on that. And so that's the same process should be thinking about here is... If I have two companies, one is terrible and one is good, why am I putting, you know, well, I should just put 10% in the bad company. No, zero. Zero is the number. <laughs> and 100% is fine in one company. Yeah. You know, that is not, it's very hard for people to understand that. Yeah. Now, you have to be right, you know, in order to do that. Yeah. And so I wouldn't recommend it until you know what you're doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but exactly. I, I mean, I don't even do that. and. Yeah. You know, I, I'm more often right than wrong, but when I am wrong, I, you know, I, you know, I, I make, do make mistakes and, yeah. you know, you sometimes fool yourself because yeah. you fail to do your checklist or what, what have you. So I think the best thing to think about when you're doing all of this stuff is think about investments in terms of my dollar could be placed in two places, into two buckets, which one will get me the better rate of return. And I could split my bucket, you know, my dollar, but I, I may also split my uh, returns, returns yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, we'll talk about the portfolio management aspect of this because I think it's really, really interesting. Yeah. yeah diversification or diversification, as some some of the authors... Yeah, Peter Lynch like to call yeah, it. Yeah, diversification. Um, we'll talk about that in the future episodes. I don't know when we're, we're going to cover this, but we'll definitely talk about the portfolio management because I think it's a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah. Okay, so that's this kind of cash flow, the actual formula of it. We took you through it. But be, be sure to be sure to check it out. Be sure to see you know what what it actually is the formula, and you can quickly Google search discounted cash flow spreadsheet or discounted cash flow calculator. You'll find several out there you could do. It's not just you know people with fancy suits in Wall Street who could do this. Anyone can do this. Yeah, and the, simplify your life and try and do this. You know, to try not to rely on the spreadsheet as much. Yep. You know, th you'll find there's a common pattern when you use like a discount rate of 10% and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, it, it, these are kind of things that you'll, you'll as you do this more often, you'll start to understand, you know, better ways. And, you know, th this is just one tool in a diverse tool bucket of valuing companies. So. Yeah, exactly. All right. That's it for us. Episode 32, Discounted Cash Flow uh, Formula. We will see you on the next episode. Thank you guys for joining us and follow us. On Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, email us at info at valueinvestor.org. If you have any questions or if you want to just chat with us, uh, please do so. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks.